Uh, yeah, welcome to another CGIR platform for big data in agriculture webinar. Uh, the CGIR platform for big data in agriculture works to harness the capabilities of big data to solve agricultural development problems faster, better, and a greater scale, uh, feeding the future bite by bite. Uh, for today's webinar, we will be looking at new platform recently launched as a part of the Guardian ecosystem, the Collaborative Guardian Lab or CG Lab. Uh, uh, this is an online collaborative analytical environment uh, that will be demonstrating uh, the capabilities uh, throughout this webinar. Uh, we will show example application we developed for analyzing smallholder farmers' climate change adaptation options, for example, and also inviting you to try it out uh, for your own research. For today's panel, we are happy to welcome Meda Devare, a senior research fellow at IPRI and also module one leader at the uh, platform, and Julian Ramirez from Biobers DC at Alliance, and Pythagoras Karampi Paris, uh, the CEO of SIO Systems, and Ni Jaoku, a senior research fellow at IPRI and also co founder of the platform. So, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, the first, some recommendation on um, uh, yeah, like how to engage engaged throughout the webinar. Uh, you can submit questions in the Q&A function below anytime you can, um, anytime you want. <laughs> At the end of each presentation, there'll be like a brief time for Q&A, uh, but you are welcome to submit questions at any time. And there'll be also time for further discussion once all the speakers have presented at the end of, um, uh, towards the end of the webinar. And yeah, we will do our best to answer all the questions you ask. And if we run out of time, uh, then we will uh, answer those questions uh, in writing and post together with webinar recording to our website. Um, and we already started polling. So yeah, we, we have included several questions throughout the webinar uh, to get your, yeah, your, uh, collect your ideas and uh, where you are uh, on this journey of data science in agriculture. Um, so yeah, let's see how this play out. So I, I will hand it over to Meta, uh, our first speaker and presenter. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Joe. So I'm uh, going to end the polling, but as you can see here really, really quickly, uh, it's a nice spread of, of um, uh, proficiencies in terms of uh, uh, programming. And I see that most people consider themselves to be either intermediate or sort of beginning programmers. And, and that's great. I mean, what we've tried to do with CG Labs is to make it an environment that's, that's yeah, easy and actionable. Um, there's hopefully something in it for, for everybody. Um, so let's, let's dive in and have a look at, at what it looks like. So um, as Jawu mentioned, I am, uh, my name is Meda Devari, and I am, if I can advance the slide, um, I'm affiliated with IFPRI and I lead uh, the organized module of the Big Data Platform, and that's focused all around organizing data, um, making it actionable, uh, managing it well uh, in order to make it actionable and so on. So I want to start um, this, this, this multi-person webinar with kind of a, let's start at the very beginning, right? There's a very famous song that, that goes that way. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do is lay the groundwork and give you just a little bit of a flavor of what CG Labs um, is. So um, let me take you di directly into uh, what we're trying to do here. Some of you may already know about the Guardian uh, data ecosystem, what we're, we're calling the Guardian data ecosystem. There are multiple parts to this. So the, the, the heart of, of that ecosystem is really, uh, if you will, the Guardian data portal. I mean, it's, it's, we call it that, I'm calling it that for lack of a better word. It's a place to go and find um, data assets, both data sets and publications, no matter where they sit. Um, and and the, the repositories that we're, we're making discoverable are all of the CGIR repositories, some 30 odd ones, because there's one publication repository and one data repository at every center typically. Um, so some 30 odd repositories there. Um, uh, there's the gene banks database, the Genesis database, where you can visualize, from which you can visualize data. And we also have data sets uh, from the USAID's Development Data Library. We've got um, uh, a few resources from the from DFID's um, uh, repository. Uh, the World Bank's LSMS data is, is discoverable through Guardian. 
um, and the Indian government's open data portal, the agricultural content there is also discoverable through Guardian. That does not mean that Guardian is holding that data. We're just pointing to it. The data continues to sit where it sits. So it's kind of a discovery mechanism for the in the agricultural sector. And then and the and the data sources we we are making any discoverable um, increase uh, year by year. The other piece of this data ecosystem is is more or less a. Um, an emphasis on making data actionable and make on making data uh, uh, variables understandable, interpretable. And for that, we have a, a, a different ways of going at it. One sort of the preferable way is to actually collect the data that's already standardized, that's already semantically understandable. Um, so, so that's that's one effort. Um, and the data, of course, once it's once it's discoverable, will be made uh, uh, point pointed to from the the Guardian uh, ecosystem, from the Guardian portal, essentially. Uh, we also have a soon to be uh, released verification workflow because we're emphasizing open and fair data. Fair meaning the data must be findable, it must be accessible, it must be interoperable, and must be use, reusable. Um, and so there, we have a fair workflow that, that uses, um, uh, enables people to upload their data sets to whatever repository they choose um, uh, using semantic standards, uh, a consistent metadata schema, and there's a privacy uh, sort of checker built into that workflow. And that's available open for anybody to use. All of this stuff is really. And then what we're going to focus on today is the pipeline. So once you have the data, there's a big so what, you know, what can I do with it now that I've found it? Um, so we're trying to build uh, mechanisms to be able to visually explore the data you find and to, of course, uh, do something with it, sort of the plug and play capability, uh, analyze that data and, and plug it into models. So, so this is sort of the holy grail of what we're trying to do. Uh, we're, we're just taking baby steps towards it with CG Labs, but that's what CG Labs is about, uh, being able to, to not only find the data, uh, which is part of it, but also explore it and, and analyze it. So um, what this, this slide is, is nice because in a nutshell, it tells you what we're trying to do. So we're trying to enable um, uh, the discovery of, of data that's shared uh, and that sits in the organizations that, that have generated it, but, but it's made visible in a consistent format and actionable in that format. Um, we, are, we are enabling collaboration. So you can set up a, a team space uh, or a lab space if you're part of a lab with your three or 10 or 20 uh, people and work together on, on uh, finding data and sharing that data uh, securely. This is the next part of, of what you see in that icon, the security management. So there's a single sign-on um, that, that's enabled through a software call, called Globus, which enables a uh, secure exchange of data. So if you have sensitive data, you can exchange that, you can share that securely across users and across your team, particularly. Um, and, and that, again, relates to the private data, the, the indexing and searching of, of data, um, uh, you know, in a, in a very secure uh, way, because it's underlain by this uh, global software. Of course, all of this is open source as well, so that's an added benefit. You know, we're trying to, to walk the walk and, and sort of walk the talk, really. Uh, we talk a lot about open, and we want to be open in every sense possible. Um, so what does CG Labs look like, uh, and what is it for? So the, the real sort of question that we're trying to answer is this kind of question. I'd like to be able to find and securely exchange data. I'd like to manage code. I want to analyze data with my team. I want to do it all in, in sort of a more or less seamless way. And I really don't want to use uh, to be emailing my data sets uh, or dropboxing them. You know, the, some of my data may be sensitive, and in any case, that's a really clunky way to manage data, especially when it's large data sets. So, so this is the kind of use case that CG Labs is, is targeted towards. This is the, the landing page. Uh, I'm just going to give you an overview of pages now, or, or uh, web pages uh, of CG Labs, just so you have a sort of a sense of what it does. Um, the first thing you see is please sign in using Globus. So you have to have a Globus account to get into CG Labs because this is all um, trying to enable secure uh, um, exchange and secure interaction with data. And for that, you have to have a Globus account. Now you can do this very easily if you have Gmail, for instance, you have a Google account. Or in many cases, you will find your institution when you go to globus.org, um, you will be able to find your institution and, and automatically log in that way because it understands um, if you're part of that institution, you, you, will, you will have access. 
So it's quite easy to set up, but you must do that. So that's, that's something to be aware of. Um, I've included the URL there. It's um, guardian.bigdata.cgr.org slash labs.php. Um, the PHP will probably drop off at some point, but, but it's essentially guardian.bigdata.cgr.org. Uh, if you go there, you'll see the Guardian data portal. If you do slash labs.php, you'll, you'll go to C, um, CG Labs. So, so that's, that's sort of where you enter. Now, uh, when you're logged in, when, you're, when, you, when you enter CG Labs, uh, what you see, it, it looks something like this. So here I'm in my group spaces at the top left, um, but, but if you look at my profile uh, at the top, top right here, um, um, under my name and my, my, I've uploaded a photograph, so you see that, um, you see my space. I can work in my space alone, my private space if I want to do that. Or I can set up, as I said, my group space with my five or 10 um, co-workers, uh, co-researchers, collaborators, whoever they might be. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm showing you here. Um, you can create a new workspace really easily. So you just click on create new space um, and, and it'll, it'll pop you up a, a, a quite easy sort of, it'll take you through a set of, um, you know, questions that you just fill in very, very uh, easily. You can specify your team members and you can enable uh, desired modules. That'll be part of this, this create new space workflow. So it's very easy to, to do that. Um, CG Labs is a very complicated offering in many ways. We've tried to make it very easy, but, but it is, um, you know, there's a lot there. And so we've, we've included a, a user manual and various guides. Um, so you can click on those guides uh, as you get started. And that panel is on again on the, on the top right. So just to give you a sort of an orientation of what you will see when you go to CG Labs and how you interact with these uh, uh, spaces. Um, now to, to actually, now I'm, I'm, I may be in my space and in my space, I may want to enable or disable certain modules. So for that, I go to my modules. Um, and if I want to enable modules, in this case, I see a bunch of disables there because I've already enabled all these modules. But if you haven't enabled them, you'll see enable, 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 and just click on the ones you want. Um, this will become a little easier to understand what these modules are because we're just changing the user experience um, still as we go along. What you're seeing with CG Labs right now is a pretty mature prototype. Um, we want you to play with it. We want feedback um, and, and we want to be able to improve it. So uh, it is ready to use. It's already being used as you'll hear from the next speaker, uh, but, but that's where we are. So um, now what I'm doing is, is clicking on find data. And, and what find data allows me to do is to do, do a search. In this case, I'm showing you a search. I've done a search for potato variety and I find a bunch of data sets um, in, in, now this is hooked up with, with that Guardian data portal that I talked about, the heart of that Guardian data ecosystem. And that's why I'm able to find these data sets from across CGIR, from you know, all of those other sources that I, that I told you about. Here, when the data set is actually CC BY or CC0, that means that it's, those are the least restrictive licenses. Um, I typically should be able to download the data. I, I just click on the, 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 the open um, uh, boxes that are associated with those CC BY and CC0 data sets. And then at the bottom of this list, you'll find a save button and I can save it and I'll see it in my, in my workspace. Um, just, just something to note here that for CGIR repositories, uh, even some CC0 and CC BY data sets are locked down. Uh, this is something we're still, um, we need to work on. Uh, but you will not be able to download them, even though they're CC0 and CC BY. Um, so that's something we're still working on, but just, just so you're aware of that uh, going forward. Right. Uh, now, what, what, what I also want to point to is this ability to securely share data. You can do some secure uploads um, and sharing of data uh, by, by clicking on the secure upload button. Uh, that will take you to the Globus, to your Globus sort of uh, account. Um, and you will be able to do this. But to do this, you have to install, you have to have installed the Globus client. And that again is something you can do quite easily um, from the Globus account. So once you're signed into Globus, you will want to install the Globus client on your laptop, and then you will be able, you will sort of be seen as a secure endpoint. And you will be able to, to upload your data or share your data um, uh, with other secure endpoints through this functionality, just so you, you're aware of that. Um, 
What I want to spend a little bit more time on is this geospatial exploration uh, uh, module that I've enabled. So now if I click on geospatial exploration, uh, what I will see is an ability to, to explore data visually look at data and do stuff with it, which is pretty cool because here we're now building out that, that functionality to be able to interact with data sets um, in a visual way. Uh, what you see here is, is several different data sets. Um, um, you'll see um, at the top, uh, there, there are four icons on the left panel here, left top panel, and one of them is a sort of crop, global crop production uh, model data. Uh, and so you'll be able to, to look at production estimates and, and slice and dice them uh, by different parameters like harvested area for any one of 35 or so odd crops um, globally. Uh, you'll be able to um, look at, you know, yield parameters. Uh, you'll be able to look at several uh, possibilities, irrigated yield, harvest, uh, uh, rain fed yield, etc. So you can play with that uh, as, as you explore this. Um, but what I've done here is to look at the, the last button, which is this a climate, a very large, uh, several terabyte climate data set, the CMIP6 data set. Um, and there are several models uh, here. I have clicked the down arrow on the CN CNRM uh, model, which is a, a French model. Um, and I've chosen a scenario. So there are um, at the bottom here, if you can see my cursor, you see SSP370. Um, and, and if you click on that, I haven't made this interactive, unfortunately, but if you, cl if you click on that, you will be able to see uh, several, all, the, all of the different model scenarios. Um, and you can choose one, choose the model, and in, in this case I've chosen precipitation, but you could choose maximum or minimum temperature, um, and, and then visualize that. So here I'm showing uh, uh, precipitation for June of 2050. Um, you, you can you can slide this this bottom cursor here um, in, in to wherever you want it, or you can play. You can use the play button to play all the way from the 2030s through to the 2080s. So it gives you uh, you know the model estimates for that particular parameter that you chose, um, and and you can visualize that. But not only can you visualize it, um, you can also query the data um, and and download the data. So how do I do this? By, by doing it this way. So here I have, if you see, if you look at, at my, uh, at India, I have used uh, my, my drop pin on the, on the right hand side here, I'm pointing to it now with the red arrow. Uh, if you look at the right panel, you see a sort of a, a pin and I've dropped that on India. And what it does when I do that is it gives me the data for India, for the thing that I chose, in this case that's precipitation, um, for June 2050 and I can download that data or I can download all of the data for India for that matter if I want. Um, so you see those two little buttons in, in, in this little box that's popped up, uh, download raw data, you can, you can do that quite easily. I can also, however, zoom in. I can, I can click on the polygon feature here, choose a particular um, uh, uh, area, maybe the Indo-Gangetic Plain or whatever part uh, I'm interested in, in that on the globe. Um, and and this, a similar thing will happen. A pop-up box for that polygon will appear with all of the data contained within that polygon uh, for this that you've specified for the parameter you specified, and I can download that data. And then, of course, this download button allows you to to download in many different ways uh, for different models. For instance, the data for different models, the data for different time periods, etc. So there's there's many interesting features here that we've enabled. Now this is this is really nice because it allows you to even as a somebody who may not may be you know one of those you, some of you said you were novices. Um, I'm actually not a programmer at all, but I can interact with this. Um, it's always been something I want to do is to learn how to code, but I never have the time for it. But but I can at least get somewhere with this stuff. You know the coders will say ah, I don't want to do this. I'll just I'm going to just go in and 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 query the way I want to query uh, um, by 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 writing the code. Now, um, the, the, the last feature that I want to focus on is the analyze data. And, and so I, again, I'm, I'm seeing that feature. I, I go there, I click on analyze data, and um, it will take me to uh, the Jupyter Notebook feature of CG Labs. And what you see here is, um, you know, the, the ability to, to code in Python and R, so you can, you can uh, do some collaborative coding here. Uh, but you also see on the left 
panel here, you see all of the data sets that I have found. So I did my find data sets earlier. I found a bunch of data sets. I downloaded some, I saved some um, in my team space. So now my team can collaboratively work on those data sets um, without having to exchange data by email or Dropbox. And I'm seeing those data sets here and I can do stuff with them. That's, that's the beauty of this. Um, so again, that's, that's the data I found through find data. I can set up work folders for, for data. Um, I can manage code from GitHub repositories. You see some of those icons at the top here, um, a folder uh, with a plus in it for, for setting up the work folders and the Git um, for, for being able to download and upload code as I, as I work on it. And here you see the coding window. Um, there is, there's already some of the functionality built out to uh, uh, models. So in, in this case, we have our Wofast and I believe the DSAT model, the, the R version is also, you can also call on that. So, so that, that, that is available and you can, you can do your coding, you can call the model um, and you can, you can uh, uh, query, you know, you can, you can write your code and, and analyze, do your, your model runs that way. So this is, this is sort of an overall sort of view of, of the analyze functionality um, of, of CG Labs, and I encourage you to go in and play with it. Um, I want to end with sort of a, a, a use case um, that you might, you might ask and sort of give the next speaker a lead in with that, because we're going to be next hearing from Julian, who actually has used CG Labs to, 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 to um, to respond to uh, certain to, to actual analytical issues, uh, analytical problems that he's addressing. But this could be one sort of question that that is um, uh, that you can use CG Labs for. I need to evaluate and recommend sustainable intensification practices for West Africa. This is a project that we've been working with um, uh, a team at University of, Fla uh, of Florida, um, Cheryl Porter, Chris Villalobos. And, and Gerrit uh, Hohenboom. Um, and, and so we've worked with them to build, to sort of not build, they've already built um, translators through the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project, AGMIP. Uh, but what we're trying to do with CG Labs is to build the connections through so that when you find data um, through Guardian, you will be able to uh, make it model ready and, and that much more easily pluggable into, you know, uh, into some model. It's still sort of, as I said, it's the holy grail, but that's, that's something that we're, um, we're working towards. Um, and you'll hear more about that kind of future capability um, when our third speaker comes online, uh, Pythagoras. But for now, I am going to hand over to Julian. So Julian, you're up. Thank you very much. All right. Great. Thanks. I don't know. Yeah. Hold on one second. I don't know, uh, Jawu, are we, are we waiting to take questions or, or are we supposed to pause here and take questions? Um, yeah, we were going to have some Q&A uh, at the end of each presentation, but yeah, I don't, I don't see any present, uh, questions specifically for your presentation, Meta. Um, okay. No, I think we can go ahead. Actually, somebody just, they, they've raised their hand, I see. Oh, ben, I see. Um, Edward Nicholson. Yeah, um, yeah, can you please type your question? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Go ahead, ahead Jabu. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, the source code shares on GitHub or other places. Yes, uh, there are many um, yeah, CGR researchers are making their source code and data analysis available through GitHub and other repositories. Currently, I, I don't think we have a centralized, dedicated kind of repository or search functionality for source code. But yeah, that, that's something you were. A short answer is no, unfortunately, but that's something we readily do. So we will look into that um, in our future plan. Uh, and Brad was asking, oh yeah, Brad was asking if we can go into a little more detail about semantic standards. It's also sure. a question for, from Laura Ralston about uh, Globus accounts being available to external CGR people. Right, okay, good. Uh, the questions are coming in. Um, so the Globus thing, so uh, external to CGIR, yes, uh, you can sign up for your own Globus account for free uh, at globus.org website. Uh, yeah, you can use your Google ID 
um, yeah, and yeah, there are many other ways you can get. For internal CGIR researchers or CGIR people, you can use your CGIR email address as a, a login. Um, and Meta, can you go a little bit more into detail on semantic standards? Absolutely, CGIR, absolutely. And yeah, sure. So, so um, I, I suspect you were asking about the top two cogs that I showed in the Guardian ecosystem slide, Bent. Um, feel free to jump in and, and speak and correct me if your impression, if you're asking about something else. But, but so, so the, 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 the top cog there related to uh, um, generating data that's already semantically enabled, and that is through uh, the field books that are used. So for instance, um, some of the, many of our breeding field books, the, the, all of the breeding field books, I believe, in fact, uh, not all, but the, the formal breeding efforts at CGIR through the Excellence in Breeding Platform, for instance, is using ontologies to, to already um, generate data that's, that's already semantically uh, tagged. Um, with, with agronomic data, we have um, a still in development, but still very usable, already usable um, fieldbook effort. It's called the Agronomy Field Information Management System. And that is built on um, semantic standards so that it's very usable. You can create your fieldbook. And when you create your fieldbook and, and um, uh, send it to the KD Smart application, for instance, to collect data, data digitally, the data that comes back, um, uh, the variables are already um, semantically uh, tagged because they, they've been developed that way. I mean, the, the field book has been developed uh, using the, the ontology uh, variables under the hood. So, so that's one of the, the ways we're doing that. And for the, for the workflow, the verification workflow, uh, the interoperability, the eye of fair there, the part of the workflow uh, is, and Pythagoras will talk a little bit more about that, I believe, but part of that workflow enables you to actually uh, see your data set that you're trying to annotate and very easily click on the, if assuming it's an Excel, you click on the, on the column headings, the data variables of the column headings, and um, it'll pop up uh, a set of concepts, or one concept or multiple concepts, along with a, a description of that concept and you choose the, the one that most closely matches uh, the intent of your data variable and so that way you're trying to, to you know assign the semantic meaning through the ontology without necessarily knowing about ontologies or which ontologies to look for or at so that's that's what we're doing with semantic um, uh, uh, enabling that and in terms of the standards themselves uh, this, the crop ontologies have been developed uh, at CGIR. Uh, Elizabeth Arnaud and her team are leading that effort through the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT. Um, and the agronomy ontology has been developed as a use, as a sort of to power the agronomy field information management system. And the, the, the socioeconomic ontology is being developed through the one of the uh, Communities of Practice of the Big Data Platform, led by Gideon Kruzman and uh, Sunho Kim. They're the primary movers and shakers with the socioeconomic ontology. So there are efforts um, also to build the standards themselves. Does that answer your question? So I, I think that's good. Okay. Um, so we yeah. could have some more discussion toward the end. Um, yeah, but I think we should move on. Uh, I see two more questions. Uh, one from Rob on infrastructure. I think Pythagoras we can, uh, can um, uh, yeah, mention that and address that question later. And uh, Ben also asked an uh, excellent question on end-to-end -end data integration, like farm-to-fork approach. And I, I think that, that would require some um, yeah, some more discussion. Yeah, let, let, let the, the, the short answer there is yes. Uh, there's a food ontology that we're uh, trying to sort of enable connections with, but we can talk offline about that as well. Feel free to write yeah. to me, Bent. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Good. Uh, so next we have Julian. Uh, so, uh, Meta, are you going to drive the slides and or, or Julian? No, I think I'm. I'm going to stop sharing, and Julian can okay, share. Good. Okay. Good. Yeah. Right. Julian, go. Go for. It. Uh, it says that host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> How do I enable attendee screen share? Uh, let's see. If not, you can just share it back. I mean, uh, then it, 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 let's just do that. That's probably quicker. Just share back your, your, your slide. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, apologies for that. I was not aware oh. of this. Yeah, so uh, so basically what 
uh, this is where it gets more real for everybody. And, and uh, because it's a real world example where we face a large computing problem and we use CG labs to try to solve it and to actually effectively solve it. The problem at hand that we had uh, in both is related to a project called the Smallholder Adaptation Atlas or the Agriculture Adaptation Atlas, which is a project we have uh, with the Gates Foundation. Uh, we're, we're collaborating with IFPRI, ICRAF, and a number of other institutions to develop this atlas to help make decisions about agricultural adaptation investments. And the specific section, the, the, the atlas basically tries to put together data on climate risk, which comprises data of three different kinds one of which is hazards. What we want uh, of is, is occurrence of climate hazards. Next. So, next. Yeah. So uh, what we want to, for, for a particular geography, what we want to be able to understand in the, in the atlas, what we want for the, the users to be able to, to, to search and, 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 and um, and find this is the occurrence and the importance and sort of the seriousness of different types of climate shocks and stresses. And so, for example, here you see an example of uh, area of, of, of sort of uh, a meteorological aridity, and then you also see an example of heat stress on labor for the combination of two geographies. One is Niger, the other one is Kenya. You could also do it for a different kind of uh, different combination of geographies uh, for different scenarios and everything. But next. And, and as I said, so we want to understand hazards because that sort of plays a role. I mean, it's one of the components of understanding risk. Next. And so the first thing that we went through was this sort of comprehensive review of what, how, how we can, uh, what kinds of hazards are, are out there and then trying to figure out which of which of those hazard, hazards we could actually put together data for and this is what we came up with so basically uh, we, we 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 decided to put together data on three three specific kinds of hazards which were important for sub-saharan africa and agriculture drought water logging heat stress and we also looked at the impacts of those hazards on crop suitability and you can see there there's a fairly long list of hazards uh, of, of sort of hazard variables um, or variables that help us characterize these three different hazards. So the number of dry days, consecutive dry days, aridity index, the standardized precipitation index, and, and, and then the next step that we had to follow was, okay, let's figure out how we can compute this, uh, this kind of stuff for both um, historical and sort of future scenarios, because as we're talking about agricultural adaptation, we're, we're talking about adaptation to both uh, existing climate shocks, but also those shocks which are expected in the future. Next. So, so this is what this is what turned it turned out to be, basically. So we we ended up with around twelve different hazard variables and six different statist summary statistics that we needed to calculate for five different scenarios: the historical climate scenario, and then uh, four future scenarios. We wanted to calculate that for a number of crops because we wanted to have sort of crop specificity, but also be able to aggregate different crops and have sort of a general sense of where different hazards are occurring. We had historical data for around 30 years. This data was a daily resolution. It was global to continental, um, continental for Sub-Saharan Africa, which is actually where the, where the Atlas focuses on. And it was a relatively high spatial resolution of five kilometers. And so all in all, what we needed to go through and calculate these, all of these derivative variables um, and ended up being around 50,000 individual layers, each of which of course has a number of pixels and, 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 and a number of uh, things that need to happen to those pixels using the daily data. So this was a large computing problem and this is where we started looking for answers. So, Next. This is an example for, uh, of one of the layers that we calculated. Next. So, so we started looking for the solutions, as I was saying. So one of the solutions is, of course, try to run whatever you can on your institutional laptop. Um, and, and mostly, at least what I have, is a MacBook Air with 
four cores and 16 GB RAM. Uh, only I can, the only person that can use it at one time is me. Um, I have admin right, rights, but some other colleagues in, in the Seattle Biodiversity Alliance do not have admin rights. And then it's not a processing computer either. Uh, most of these computers that we get given for, for are, are mostly designed for writing reports or, and emails and these type, type of things and not for large uh, scale computing. Next. And the second option, of course, is looking at your in-house processing servers, but because of the high demand from different projects uh, and, and also sometimes slow response from IT team or, or, or lack of capacity to, to properly maintain the libraries, the geospatial libraries and so forth, which is required for the kinds of uh, things that we are doing. Um, either the servers are overcrowded or they're not quite usable because they don't have the right software versions and so the code doesn't work and it's a high transaction cost. Scaling up the system to meet the computing requirements that we had also implies high transaction costs and purchasing new equipment and all kinds of things. If, you need, if several people need to access it, well, we, you need to use a VPN to make, to make sure it's secure, but then to make, to, 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 to give VPN access to external users outside our own center, even within the CGIAR, is already hard and implies time and processing of some kind of bureaucratic documents and things. And, and, but one advantage is, of course, that it's connected to a local storage system in, um, in our organization. Next. Uh, then, of course, we could look at uh, cloud computing with our own setup. But then uh, this requires having the in-house expertise to set up this type of thing. Um, of course, it also implies transaction costs because you need to purchase and set up the, the, the cloud computing service. You need to decide what cloud computing service you're going to have. Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, whatever other things. And, and uh, plus, we didn't quite plan for 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 have, for for creating a cloud computing uh, service for, for our own needs in this project. So it was not quite uh, factored in the time that we had available. And then lastly, uh, but not least, of course, is CG Labs. So CG Labs was an option that was already shareable computing resource with a large uh, com and scalable computing power. What we ended up assigning to this project was around 60 CPUs with 500 gigabytes of RAM and then three terabytes of local storage for to be able to do processes. It's stable, fast, and there's very little transaction cost to set up. I think all in all, it took around a week from the time we decided to, to set it up. I mean, to, to scale it up to this, to this level that we needed and, uh, and, uh, and, and to have it running, right? So, so it, it was fairly fast and there's other advantages that I'm gonna go through in the next couple of slides. So we decided to try CG Labs at this point uh, because, of, uh, yeah, because of all of, these, uh, all of these characteristics. So how does it work, right? So you saw from me a, a few of the different characteristics of CG Labs and, and I wanted to show you how it looks, how it looks like for, for somebody like me or people in my team. So CG Labs, uh, once you access the, the, the processing capabilities of CG Labs, you're going into the, to the analytical workflows in Jupyter, right? So in Jupyter, you can access, you can, you can do stuff in three languages, one that is called Julia that I don't really have any experience with, and then the other two are Python and R, which is the most common languages used for geospatial processing these days. So. Uh, so CG Labs is tied to a specific computing resource. In this case, in our case for the Application Atlas, it was uh, Amazon Web Services, but you can also install CG Labs on your local computing resources and make it publicly available if you wish to do so. So, so, so that's how it is there online. But then the next thing is, okay, how do I, how do I go in it? So I log in through Globus account. The nice thing about CG Labs next is that Anybody can log in. So people in my team that also work in, C, in, uh, in the CL Biodiversity Alliance, they can log in at whatever time and collaborate with me and do things. And then most importantly, the, sa the same transaction cost, which is very little, involved in me connecting, somebody from my team in Cali connecting, uh, is involved in somebody 
from another CG center, for example, connecting. And for that matter, anybody that can have a Globus account. So anybody can really go there and utilize this computing power that we have available. That we have available. And actually what we ended up doing is that we extended the capabilities so that not only we could address this hazards problem, but we could also address the app page and options problem, which is also which also involves a lot uh, processing processing um, of uh, the suitability of pra of agricultural practices for around 160 practices for a number of crops. So the nice thing about CG Labs again is that you, you can share this resource and you can you can also do it do do the de development and development of your scripts and your so we do spatial analysis collaboratively without needing to change any kind of platforms. You can just clone your GitHub repositories, your own and somebody else's, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's all transparent, it's all there. And the other thing that we found to be super handy is next, is the data. So one, there is very little transaction cost involved in linking to CGIR data that is already mapped in Guardian. So Guardian, Guardian basically maps and harvests data from all of the Dataverse repositories at the different centers, say from Biodiversity CIAD or from IFPRI or whoever else. And this gives us access already to a lot of data um, that, that we needed to do this analysis. So this includes CCAPS climate, maps, spam, or the soil profiles and things like that. But additionally, we wanted to, to have access to other data, which is not mapped into Guardian, next. So to do that, we needed to download. So that implies some tra transaction costs, but the, because the, ser the servers are on the cloud, it's actually quite fast. Uh, next. And then very nicely, the development team of CG Labs, so Pythagoras team, uh, were, were nice enough to allow us to build a, 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 a SFTP transfer mechanism so that we could also move data from CG Labs to our local laptops or to the storage system at BioRCC at uh, very, very easily, basically. So basically we, what, what that means is that not only we could collaborate in the platform, we could develop and, 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 and address the processing problem in a very effective way, but we could also sort of access all of these different data sources that we needed to address the problem. So that all in all sort of created a very, very nice solution. So the other thing is that as we kept progressing, we needed more libraries and, 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 and adjustments into the system and those things. And, and, uh, and the SIO team, Pythagoras team, uh, was very, very extremely responsive and, 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 uh, and very fast and effective at getting things done and customizing the system in such a way that it would actually be uh, exactly what we needed. Next. And so, and apart from the adaptation atlas, I also wanted to say that there's a few projects that have benefited from the CG Labs capabilities. There's around six projects by, by my account. And, and uh, there's a team of, already, of around 10, 12 people that have been using it in the last three to four months. Uh, here's a list of those projects um, that we have and all of them involve some type of geospatial processing. Next. So our experience, if I want to synthesize our experience, is that it was easy to use. The system is fairly easy to use. You don't need to be a, a Linux expert or, or Unix expert of any kind to be able to use CG Labs. Um, of course, th there's a little bit of learning that you need to do to be able to create close account, do simple things like that, but also to be able to use, use the framework. And if you want to use the, 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 the Linux command line, then there's some, trans there's some uh, learning curve there, but to actually to use the system, if you know how to program in R, for example, it's, it's fairly, fairly easy. You can share the system with anybody, right? So I can, I can, I, I, I can share, uh, I can share the computing resources with my team with, or with anybody in any project that I'm, that I'm uh, involved in right now. The, the tech support from, from the team of, from the SIO team that have been developing the, the system is, is very fast and reliable. We were able to talk to them one-on-one -on -one all the time through Slack channels. Um, it's custom, the system is customized and custom, customizable basically. So, I mean, during the time that we were using it, they, I mean, 
the 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 the, the, the tech support team installed a number of I don't know I don't know maybe fifty or so geospatial processing libraries. Uh, they compiled and made available all the DSAT framework and. And the, and the system keeps evolving as we as we sort of requested more things and, and keeps being sort of responding to our needs. All of the data of the CGR as as well is sort of ready at your fingertips, right? So because it's all linked to the Dataverse repositories, which are mapped into Cardian, then you can easily include it in whatever workflows and analysis pipelines you have. Um, if 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 it's not mapped on Guardian, then it's still very fast to download data because all these servers are in the cloud. Next. It's also easily scalable, right? So you, you, you can just bump the processing capacity or reduce it and reduce the, 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 yeah, the, the, the cost essentially of the, of the computing power. And then finally, one thing that I found really nice is because the system runs on, on Jupyter, on the Jupyter package, then Jupyter has this capability of notebooks, which I find extremely nice to allow replicability and also using teaching, but also uh, debugging and testing of your code and looking at the data and those kind of things. So you don't really have to use your laptop for anything other than to go on the web browser and access the system. So you don't really need to have a very powerful laptop and that also reduces your own cost. Um, and there's a few things that we thought also could be very useful to have in the future. So one is uh, being able to share data. So, so far that's, that's not quite there. So to share data, you, you have to sort of download and then share with somebody else or publish it uh, in a repository and then that it can be shared, but there's no sort of real time sharing of data. That would be ideal to have. Then the other thing is to be able to combine computing resources. So right now the, the platform is sort of centric on Amazon Web Services, you'd be great. But we have, for example, at Seattle Biodiversity Alliance, we have some credits with Google Cloud, which we would like to use into the system as well, combine it with what we already have on, uh, from Amazon Web Services. And finally, there's a number of data sets that uh, are stored in Amazon, in the Amazon Cloud. And that would be great also to be able to access directly. So this is maybe more on the technical side of things, what we would like to, the, the kinds of capabilities we would like to see, but, um, but you, you, you get a, hopefully you get a sense of, of sort of the level of engagement that we had with the platform. And then finally, I mean, for all of those, all of, for all of, for all of you here in this webinar that have been struggling to be able to do large computing jobs and, and, and have been frustrated because you cannot do it in your laptop or your institution's uh, processing capacity is not that high or the servers are not maintained. Um, the, the, yeah, I mean, what I want to say is the future is here. Uh, that CG Labs really does address the, the computing problem, in, the large computing problems in, in a very, very effective and nice way. And most importantly, what I think the nice thing is that in a very customizable way, so you basically come up with your own solution in a way. Um, and even if you, if your institution happens to have big computing power, you can still connect that computing power to CG Labs. So that's, that's also nice. And the, one of the nice things, what I wanted to end with is that ultimately you can create a workflow that starts from uh, data that is available and published in a public repository in your institution or in whatever institution and then do all of your analytical workflow and take it all the way to publication back to your repository in Guardian or whatever. And there are some papers uh, that have been coming up coming out recently where people already published the Jupyter notebooks and uh, with with CG Labs, you can basically create a fully replicable piece of, piece of research from getting the data from, from the public repository to producing the output that went into the publication, including the plots and everything. So, and then make it public, uh, make that output public, publicly available in, in, in your own repository or, or through Guardian, whatever. So, so it, it really, it, it, it's quite a powerful tool for research. That's what I wanted to share. Thanks. OK.
Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, Julian, for the presentation. Uh, Veda, are you still there? Oh, you're still there. Yes. So with, uh, yeah, uh, so I think it's time to open the second set of questions on the poll. Um, so let's do that. And um, Julian, we, we have been, uh, Pythagoras and I have been answering some questions that uh, I think we can answer. Uh, then one of the questions is from Rob uh, on the library dependencies. And I, I think Pythagoras can also answer in terms of infrastructure management side. But uh, Julian, from your side, uh, when you were developing your system on CG Lab, uh, did you have any difficulty managing uh, library dependencies or how, how did you go around that? No, not at all. We use R mostly. Um, there's, for some R libraries, there's a number of system dependencies and those um, need, to need to be installed by the root, by the system root. But that is, that would be Pythagoras' team and that was fast. And then the rest you can do yourself, basically. In R at least you can install the packages directly. So yeah, and for some of the operations lately, they also were nice enough to, to give us uh, root access for, for, for some operations that we needed to perform. So that's also a possibility. So as I said, you know, there's, there's no risk. The worst that can happen is that you really deleted something you shouldn't delete and then you just reinstall from scratch the whole system and there's no loss in anything because uh, you have your scripts, you can re replicate everything. So yeah, but no problems at all with that. Um, I don't think... uh, I will also oh, yeah, refer to this uh, later on in uh, the next section. Yes, so yes. Uh, keep this uh, uh, this question unanswered yet, yes. uh, and okay. uh, I will uh, uh, I will zoom a little bit uh, on some details of this. Okay, excellent. Um, Veda, are we ready to launch the second set of questions? The second set of questions. So yeah, the, yeah. There are two questions that we ask after Julian. So there was one about the dependencies, and then uh, oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, the, on, on the poll, uh, the, the Zoom oh, poll. Oh, that's right. Sorry, <laughs> forget <laughs> about that. <laughs> we we made it overly complicated. <laughs> There's a question by Leroy. Ah, good. So uh, Leroy is asking: Is there a cost to the project to use CG Lab, or are the costs okay. covered by the big data platform? And the the answer is it depends the roy on what your demand of computing power is if you really need to scale up the system in such a way that it implies that that is not covered by the current um infrastructure running at ifpri then yes you need to pay for that uh, scaling up part um but if you can do your processing using the the, the ifpri cluster where, where the where the current version is running then that's fine too Maybe Jawu, you can complement that. Right. So we don't have plan to charge like specific project or any individual users yet. <laughs> so we are still kind of prototyping. And uh, you are our testers and our beta users. So we don't have any plan for charging cost necessarily at this point yet. But yeah, we will enormous then yeah we might have to go back but yeah for now it, it's it's everything free uh you can go ahead and do whatever you want and you can uh and, and let's see, yeah, we will see how it goes uh yeah I, I see there's a question about world bank group nothing uh organizational partner or global but i'm not sure uh but again like if you have any problem being on google uh global uh, you can use your google account hope you already have google account in one way or another so i think that would be probably easier way to sign on. We do have, you know, um, at CGIR, Leroy I, uh, was just here and he's hopefully still is. Um, he is the, he's managing that for us. So he's, he's organized some webinars. He's, he's, he's the point person really. Um, I hope I'm not misrepresenting that Leroy, but um, he is Mr. Globus for CGIR. Okay. So if you have questions about that, then uh, you know, I can, one of us could probably put you in touch with any detailed type of uh, questions you have. Um, if Pythagoras and Sotiris and the SAYU team are not uh, able to, to answer them or to take some of the pressure off them, perhaps. <laughs> uh, Zavu, may I, uh, may I uh, yeah. 
say something more about the question of Leroy because this is important uh, about the costs. Uh, City Labs is an open source project, so it has no cost. Anybody can just uh, uh, take it and install it, uh, either in his laptop or on premise infrastructure. Uh, it's cloud native, so this means that it can be deployed in uh, all cloud providers. Uh, what we provide uh, uh, in Guardian is a demo account, a demo CG Lab account uh, that uh, anybody can go uh, and uh, get a feeling of all the functionalities. Obviously, if you have uh, a certain uh, need that uh, uh, requires uh, extensive com uh, computing resources, like the case of uh, Williams and uh, uh, Williams team, then you need to, to take uh, uh, CG Labs and deploy it in an infrastructure that can support this experimentation. And currently this goes beyond the scope of uh, uh, what the Big Data Platform provides. We, we offer, we, uh, we make this uh, uh, offering uh, uh, an open offering so that all the centers and beyond CGAR also uh, uh, partners and teams can take this and uh, uh, use uh, this uh, bundle of features and make their life easier uh, uh, and, live, and make their life easier. It's not something that uh, is, uh, uh, it tries to hook or uh, tries to, to be an environment hosted by the platform. Uh, right, so, so yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so after, after this webinar, uh, we will also send out a survey to learn more about your demand and your research requirement, what kind of research you want to run. And yeah, I think that will also give us some ideas on how we can better prepare our platform, also what kind of functionalities that we can provide for you. Um, and yeah, we can discuss more in detail. Like it's, it's really case by case how best we can support this uh, infrastructure. Okay, so uh, the quick, uh, taking a quick look at the survey response. Um, so, oh, so about 40% of people are already using some level of cloud computing, but majority is no. Um, so yeah, maybe this is your gateway to use uh, start using cloud computing so we can uh, use this opportunity. And um, your proficiency in programming in R or Python, because those are two other than Julia that no one seems to know, uh, know how it is to use yet. Um, so, yeah, I, I see, yeah, we, we have, yeah, a lot of expert advanced intermediate users. And there are some novice users too. Uh, but yeah, I think it looks like a uh, majority of our audience already has some experience using R and Python. So yeah, you are practically ready. So yeah, excited to see the level of skills uh, in this uh, webinar participation. Great. Uh, okay, thanks. So uh, let's move on to the next presentation from Pythagoras. Um, so Amanda, I, I guess it will be easier if you uh, if you can advance slide and uh, Pythagoras can. Sure, I'll, I'll over continue over. doing that. Overlay. Okay, good. I am assuming you can see my screen still, right? Uh, yes. Okay, yes. good. Okay, go ahead, Pythagoras. Uh, so I'm Pythagoras, I'm the CEO of SIO. Uh, we are the team that uh, uh, developed the CG Labs. Next, please. Uh, what I will present is uh, the plans for uh, the future. But uh, before going to that, uh, let's do a, a recap of uh, where we stand now. So uh, CG Labs uh, uh, offers mainly uh, four things. The ability to uh, uh, set data uh, and discover data across different uh, 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 levels or across different uh, uh, groups. A group can be a project team, uh, a lab, or uh, a bigger uh, team of uh, distributed members. Uh, the idea behind CG Labs was to enable collaboration across uh, different members, but obviously you can also, uh, with the hat of uh, or, uh, of a scientist or with the hat of a data manager, you can uh, also use it uh, in a standalone version. One of uh, the primary uh, uh, features that we uh, uh, 
uh, I wanted to enable is uh, the uh, ability uh, to handle both open and private data. And this is mainly tackled via the use of uh, Globus, which enables role-based access and the single sign-on. So it's important uh, to, uh, to mention, as uh, uh, there were also many uh, questions in the chat, that uh, for uh, those uh, uh, users that are affiliated with uh, uh, CGR and have a CGR account, CGR uh, is already uh, has already a license uh, in Globus, so you can use your CGR account. For those that uh, are not members of CGR, uh, you can simply use uh, a, a Google ID uh, and uh, then uh, log in via Globus to CG Lab. So it's an environment where uh, literally uh, anyone can enjoy, either he, uh, he or she is a CGR member uh, or not. Next. Obviously, it's a, and it's a, an open source project. We will soon we will uh, uh, open also the code uh, via uh, in uh, in a relevant uh, uh, GitHub. Uh, what we consider uh, as the main benefits of CG Labs uh, is uh, the ability of scientists to focus on the real work. So one of the uh, one of the big issues that we try to to tackle is all the complexity, as it was mentioned by, uh, by Rob in, in a relevant question, uh, if and how we have uh, tackled the complexity of different libraries, the dependencies of different libraries, versioning, uh, different tooling. Uh, what we want here is actually to enable a secured place for uh, working alone or uh, working with others that actually uh, uh, is flexible enough to enable seamless integration of tools and data set. Uh, also, uh, to provide a flexible deployment scheme. So this means that you can run it in your laptop, you can run it in, uh, in uh, on-premise uh, infrastructure or in your uh, preferred uh, cloud provider, Google, Amazon, uh, uh, Microsoft, whatever this is. Uh, and to have uh, and to provide easy access to both tooling, to relevant tooling, and uh, to data sets. Uh, so as for the scientists to focus uh, on the real work, as, uh, as Julian described uh, before. So this is actually the burden that CG Labs uh, tries to provide. Currently, there is a, 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 a series of uh, tools and data already integrated with uh, within CG Lab, so uh, uh, when you will go and uh, just install it in your laptop, you will have a light uh, interface, a lightweight interface that uh, all the APIs will be there so that you can enjoy uh, having access, uh, easy access to high value big data with global coverage. Uh, at this stage, we, uh, uh, we cover climatic data, both in P5 and in P6. Uh, also, we have uh, connectors to crop production statistics, map spam ranging from 2000 up to 2017. Uh, uh, this is a pool of uh, uh, more than 12 terabytes of available data that is uh, that is really easy to access. And also, there is a, a, a bundle of analytical models and services. Uh, we have uh, created a, a a bundle of uh, around 75 libraries in R and Python for geospatial analysis. This bundle is, uh, has been also uh, 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 published as a, uh, as a separate Docker and is uh, currently uh, available via GitHub. I have already shared uh, a link in, uh, in a relevant uh, question here. Uh, and also you can enjoy working with different uh, crop modeling tools like EcoCrop, Vufus, and DSAT and also uh, a tool called Analogs for Climatic Modeling. The idea is that uh, since this is extend uh, uh, the architecture is extendable, you can uh, always uh, uh, get the code, get the core code, you can extend it, uh, providing new models, new tools, and obviously, if you want to contribute back to the community, you can share with others 
uh, by forking the project in the, in the GitHub and share with others also the, the new tools and new data connectors that you uh, you have uh, made, uh, you have uh, added on. Uh, one issue uh, here is how easy is getting all this data. Uh, just to give you an example, next please. Uh, CMP6 is a data set uh, consisting of uh, uh, some terabytes. Uh, you can just get uh, the CMP data uh, for, a, uh, for a specific area. Here is an example uh, for uh, uh, an area called, a region called Karim Nagar in India. Uh, and you can uh, download data in your private space in CGAR, in CG Labs, uh, and start working with, with uh, this data in two different formats, in GeoJSON or in uh, CSV, only with uh, some clicks. So you, you need just to go to the relevant uh, tool, select the CMP6 model that you want, uh, data for, pin the region, select the time period, and then with a, a click button, you can download the data in your private space. Obviously, uh, at that point, you can work with the data as Julian uh, presented and share with others to continue uh, your analysis and whatever. This is the type of, of things that we try to unlock uh, uh, and to make really, really uh, simple the uh, the accessing of uh, accessing to data that are complex and uh, big enough, so uh, it's almost unrealistic to tackle with uh, with a laptop or with a desktop uh, uh, machine. Next, please. Our future plan, obviously, is uh, to have uh, uh, on one hand is to have uh, more tools. Uh, what we are uh, working on with, uh, the col with the collaboration with the University of Florida uh, is uh, to extend the Guardian verification workflow with a crop ontology to um, a CASA vocabulary translator, trying to enable interoperability with AG uh, MAP tools. I will fo focus a little bit on, on this uh, uh, because uh, uh, many of you may not uh, be aware of what the Guardian verification uh, workflow uh, is about and uh, also we are uh, uh, we have starting uh, to, to think about uh, uh, creating several versions of different tools uh, like uh, uh, the DSAT crop modeling tool so as to provide them uh, uh, as lambda functions uh, to and optimize the computational resources uh, needed for those uh, demanding, uh, for such demanding tools. Uh, next, please. Uh, for those that are not aware of, uh, of about the Guardian verification workflow, is is a, a workflow that uh, uh, tries to uh, to describe uh, data sets with metadata at uh, different levels uh, and. Uh, provides a, a way to publish uh, to publish those uh, metadata along with uh, the data set. Uh, conceptually, it consists of four different steps. At the first, uh, at the first step, uh, we use the Guardian services to check for personal identif identifiable information. Uh, so the user uh, gets a report about uh, potential risks. Uh, currently, we uh, we detect uh, uh, names, we detect uh, geospatial uh, coordinates, uh, th that type of, uh, of sensitive information. Uh, we, uh, the the, wor the uh, verification workflow is based on the use of uh, COPO to describe the data set with metadata as a whole. It uses behind the scenes globus for all the uh, data, uh, data file transmission. Uh, the, at, the at the third level, at the third step, uh, we suggest the use of the CGR guide uh, to select the appropriate uh, license. And the fourth uh, conceptual step is again to use COPO to annotate, uh, uh, to go deeper in the uh, data files and annotate uh, the different variables uh, within individual data files. I think uh, I saw a question about uh, uh, the ontologies and uh, the semantic uh, uh, resources that uh, all these uh, uh, systems uh, use. Uh, uh, COPO is connected to uh, uh, EPIs 
ontology lookup service. So uh, literally, we uh, we built upon all the uh, ontologies uh, like uh, crop ontology, unit ontology, and many many others that are already registered in the ontology lookup service. Uh, at the end of this uh, uh, workflow, you end up with uh, with a packet. Uh, that contains uh, the dataset files, the metadata about the dataset, and also the uh, variable annotations, the annotations of the different variables uh, to, uh, that link back to different uh, ontological terms. And uh, we offer two options for publishing. Uh, one to, that goes to institutional repositories uh, if the institutional repository uh, is or will be connected to Guardian uh, in, uh, in the future, or option B to publish directly to Harvard's Dataverse and get DOI in the case that the, uh, the dataset is, uh, has an open license. Next, please. Uh, as, I, uh, I, as I said before, uh, using this workflow, you, uh, you have the ability to uh, provide metadata at two different uh, layers. One is the data set as a whole. And this is important because we need to understand that uh, providing this link, the link to, uh, to different uh, terms, uh, to different ontological terms, uh, provides the ability, to, uh, the ability to search engines, including Guardian, to make uh, queries, to, 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 uh, to, uh, uh, to make uh, queries to data that comes from totally different sources source, uh, sources that use radically different classification schemes and this is the uh, the backbone technology uh, that uh, the guardian and uh, big search engines actually use in order to find and gather results that come from different cgr centers and uh, all the other data sources that we have the deeper uh, level the data file level is used in order to enable data aggregation in a query uh, uh, from heterogeneous but semantically related data sources. And this is exactly the point, next please, where we can connect uh, all the data that uh, have been harvested uh, from Guardian with the ACMIP tools. Next please. Uh, ACMIP uh, the AGMIP data notation structure consists of, uh, of three different uh, 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 structures. These uh, structures are called uh, sidecars. The first sidecar uh, is very similar, next please, to step four of uh, the existing uh, Guardian workflow. So th this file is uh, a mapping between dataset variables to uh, ontological terms. Uh, and uh, uh, one idea is uh, to map, to use mappings between existing ontology like uh, the crop ontology uh, back to ICASA variables. Next, please. And introduce a new step uh, that will uh, actually, behind the scenes, uh, will create sidecar uh, uh, files uh, uh, number two, which have the, tra the transformation between uh, the ontological terms mapped to ICASA. And this will allow actually the data to be transformed uh, using the relevant transformers that uh, the University of, of Florida uh, brings in uh, to be transformed uh, in those formats uh, that ACMIP tools uh, require and uh, enable in that sense the integration and the ability to use seamlessly uh, 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 data that are conformant with with uh, this uh, uh, with these specifications. Next, please. Obviously, the second uh, part of our future plan is to include more data. There are many ideas on the table, starting from the three uh, th three thousand uh, rice genomes project, the water data portal, the CGR, geo network nodes, the Servir uh, global project datasets, and many, many others. As always, uh, we are open to suggestions. Uh, if you uh, think that a certain tool or a certain 
uh, uh, data set is of high value and should be included in the list of uh, our future plans. Uh, don't hesitate to, to contact uh, Meta, uh, Javru, me, uh, uh, and propose uh, new, new, new items. We are always open to do uh, more things and to make uh, uh, the life uh, for everyone easier. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the presentation, Vitaros. So we have some technical questions. Actually, we have many technical questions waiting for you, uh, Vitaros, to address. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so actually, right, right before, before we get to there, uh, so this additional data source, that, that's a really important question. We have been expanding our kind of coverage of external data sources or make it kind of interoperable with our CGIR data. Um, yeah, one of the questions just asked was uh, if World Bank data are automatically accessible. Um, so I don't think we have World Bank data as a source at this point, but I think there's certainly something we can do. Uh, so Meta, do you have? No, we do. Comment? We do have um, do? the LSMS. Um, so oh, yeah, a lot right. of the LSMS data is, is already accessible, uh, but but there is much more that that we haven't uh, yet tapped. So that that will be coming on hopefully soon. So yeah, that, that's an excellent question. That's exactly the kind of feedback we'd like to connect, uh, con collect from this uh, this engagement. So yeah, thanks for suggesting that. Oh no no, go, go back, go back, go back. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and uh, Pythagoras, uh, maybe you can go through the questions in the. Okay, yes, this is what yeah. I'm doing now. I'm going. Through okay, the good. Yeah, please go ahead. I suppose that, that you can continue with your presentation where, where oh, no, no, in the I, meantime. Um, okay, so should, should I go, go first? So I mean, there are very specific technical questions, like is it possible to start a Jupyter instance to to have a access to a GPU um, and the cost and resource? So all the cost and pricing questions, I, I think, yeah, Pitara briefly mentioned that earlier, but yeah, let's put it to the end. Uh, we can maybe have another clarifying discussion on that. Uh, but GPU question, uh, Pitara, can you briefly answer? Yeah, uh, this is this is exactly why uh, we, uh, in, the, in our next uh, plans, we are going uh, towards the Lambda function, uh, so as to have some tools uh, ready to be used over GPU-enabled uh, infrastructure. Uh, the, uh, the Jupyter and all the other modules that currently we have uh, do not run on uh, GPU-enabled uh, uh, infrastructure because their intention is not uh, uh, that way. But uh, some modules uh, that are of high importance, and this is again a space uh, where we are open for uh, the community to point to tools that uh, it makes sense to have them uh, in uh, Lambda, as a Lambda function, for example, we are, uh, we are again open uh, to, to discuss it and to, to include it in our future plans. Thanks. Um, and, and just very quickly, again, the, this is a really important question. Uh, how do we, or, or, or what, what are the steps to get external data sources like uh, chirps and other data sources uh, to CG Lab? Just briefly. Yeah. It, it depends on it depends on the on the size. Mm. Uh, what we did in the case of uh, of uh, CMP5 uh, data and CMP6 data, these data are uh, quite uh, uh, big data sets. We are talking about data sets that only the CMP5 data set is about uh, seven terabytes. So what uh, uh, we did, the original team from Siad. Uh, had uh, uh, stored them in uh, an S3 bucket, in a, an uh, AWS S3 bucket, and uh, they, uh, they created an API. And uh, then from uh, the perspective of CG Labs, it was just uh, 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 to, to, to write a wrapper over the, that API. Uh, it, so it depends on the case. Typically for the big ones, uh, this should reside outside CG Labs so that all, all uh, of the users of CG Labs could enjoy them without actually having to replicate them uh, in, uh, in their side. And this is uh, one of the big, uh, the important uh, features of CG Labs. 
and the architecture of cloud computing because you can have a big asset stored once and all the community without no extra uh, costs uh, for, for, clubs, for cloud storage could enjoy uh, the, us the usage of it. Exactly. So, um, oh, so yeah, AWS Open Data Repository already has lots of open data sets uh, in exactly. the bucket. And if that's the case, we can just point to that. So it'll be really easy for, for us to integrate that. Okay, so I will present a few more slides. Uh, so my, my uh, last kind of section of this presentation today um, on CGLAB challenge. So I, I work at IPRI uh, with a bunch of economists. So everything is incentive. Uh, how to incentivize uh, like farmers and policy makers to make these changes. And yeah, we, we understand this is great. Uh, a little bit maybe overwhelming, like a new functionality and new tools. Um, so we really want you to try, we really want you to use it uh, the way we expected people to use it. So we are opening a mini challenge and uh, that we hope you will enjoy uh, using it uh, to answer some of the specific questions we wanted to uh, discuss and explore together. So yeah, next slide. And so why we are doing this? Um, so again, like open and fair data is just the beginning. There are lots of data becoming open, but yeah, unless you actually use it, it's like a food ingredient when you are cooking. So you really need something to develop new analysis together. Um, and this collaborative data analysis capabilities. So uh, is something we have been hearing over and over from users like you um, to, to develop for this specifically agriculture R&D community and here it is, so we have it now. So we want to give it, give the, turn the table and it's now your turn, uh, please try it and see what you can find. And also I'm, um, while doing that, uh, because we are still doing kind of uh, testing and prototyping stage, uh, so we, we feel quite comfortable opening up to your use, uh, but uh, there might be some bugs and maybe there are some uh, more improvement to be made, and we want to hear your feedback um, on how we can make it better and suit better to your needs. Okay, next slide. So that's the motivation that's behind this. Uh, so what we want you to do, uh, basically follow CGLAB user guide. Yeah, there are a lot of questions again already on how do you how you access to CGLAB through Globus um, within CGIR, external CGIR. Uh, anyone can uh, access and there is a user guide already on the website so you can follow that step by step and yeah once you are in it uh, create a workspace make a team um, yeah more than one user you can bring multiple colleagues to the team like uh, Julian presented and explore CGL's data uh, from CGLab accessing Guardian's rich catalog catalog and also you can upload your own data to mesh up with existing data. So yeah, just explore what you can do using CG Labs. And, and you can some data analysis uh, on Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Labs, uh, like CG Labs, uh, the analytics environment in R and Python using your programming skill. Um, next. So uh, we are giving you a specific topic uh, relevant for the, uh, for the presentation given by Julian, so which is climate change adaptation, uh, which is also very important for, not, not just for agriculture, but in general food system um, wide and also SDG wide, uh, adapting to climate change is a really serious and um, a critical issue. Uh, so it has a really high priority in CGIR's uh, research agenda. Uh, so we want you to also help us uh, explore options for adaptation and what kind of hazards out there. So the good news is all the data is there. The CME6 data, the humongous climate change product projection data is already in CGLAB. You don't have to download or anything. Uh, so fetch some of the data uh, from CME6 archive uh, in CGLAB and see what it tells you about future climate in your hometown or, or your location or nearest farming area in your location or uh, your favorite place that you visit for vacation or you know, whichever place you, you pick for analyzing this data. So yeah, it will give you some ideas on how much change that we are being, uh, we are projecting for the future. Like for example, 
um, between baseline like 2000 ish and 2050, uh, there are significant changes already projected, or we are already living in that changes. So yeah, take a look at those uh, hazard layers and see what will be the projected change. Uh, next. And then uh, overlay that with exposure. So what is the current crop production area, for example? Uh, that's your map spam data, again, also in DigiLabs. Uh, you can visualize in through Geospatial Explorer, or you can also bring the data directly into your environment and analyze the data value in uh, statistical analysis. Uh, you can analyze that with some kind of different uh, secondary data you want to bring. Uh, so on the left hand side, you're seeing a 100 meter resolution population density map from world map, uh, world pop. Uh, there are this kind of secondary data, very useful secondary data everywhere. And, and there, not everything is on CGLAB right away. But again, uh, if they are already in AWS open data catalog, you can just point to it. Um, you, you can also download data from secondary sources and upload to CGLAB. And you can do a lot of your own creative uh, new analysis by overlaying climate hazard uh, into uh, on the, the exposure level of exposure on food, food systems or, or, or rural population or the smallholders or farming systems, etc. So yeah, we, we want you to do a little bit of overlay analysis on uh, climate hazard and exposure. Uh, next. And finally, what's very really important for us as a research topic is adaptation strategy, a kind of climate change adaptation options are available. And given the projected climate hazard, some of the options that we are discussing developing may or may not be the best and uh, suitable one in the future. So uh, here we want you to do a little bit more research on uh, the CG Labs and Guardian ecosystem is not just on programming data science. We have a vast amount of Publications also open access. You can access access through Guardian interface. Uh, so there are lots of additional data set you can search from Guardian, and then yeah, you can probably develop your own idea. And of course, there are other many other literature, um, yeah, research outputs out there on climate change adaptation in different areas and different sector. So we want you to synthesize, kind of bring all that together, and let us know what you find uh, from that analysis uh, mini research. Next. Okay, so what we are looking for is again, again our idea and motivation of doing it is to motivate enough, <laughs> motivate you enough to get start uh, using CGLAB. We are not really asking you to write a research paper or report here. Uh, we just want you to use CGLAB enough uh, and do using different functionalities, uh, downloading data, searching data from CGIR or upload your own data to analysis and also share with your colleagues uh, and scripting the process through R and Python so that we can reproduce your output. And the same steps that you would go through in research project, but and not, you don't necessarily need to put too much effort into the quality of research at, at this point and for this specific challenge. So get, having that in your mind, um, uh, we would like to come back to us with like small five slide mini presentation. Um, it, again, uh, we are not going to really do peer review kind of thing. Uh, we would like to just see how you use CGLabs and if CGLabs we design and develop today can support your analysis to come up with that analysis. You will have about a month of time uh, starting next week and up, we will select up to four winners. And we are still debating exactly how we will do and what kind of prize we will offer. Um, and yeah, all this information will be made available and announced through the, the Big Data Platform newsletter next week. So don't forget to subscribe the newsletter from Big Data Platform website, and there is a link here. And the official announcement will go out next week. And the winners will be chosen based on your, I think the, the tentative topics are uh, the best analysis, best visualization, uh, best presentation and maybe more creative analysis, etc. So yeah, again, there will be many different ways that we would like to interact and engage with you through this process and looking forward to see how you use it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's all for my presentation. And I think we can finally get back to open Q&A. Thank you.
So one thing, um, Jabu, real quick, I forgot to post the, a, a link to the survey in the chat. So we have a small survey, very brief survey that we'd love for you to, to do, uh, which will give us feedback that we can use to enhance CG Labs. Um, and I will post the, the, the link right now in the chat. So please uh, feel free to do that after the webinar. Um, and Jawu, if you want to post the link to subscribe that you have in the, in the chat, that might not be a bad idea also. Yeah. So let me let me post the the chat the the link to the to the survey first. Whoops, I can never find the right screen. Here we go. So survey. So it's just a simple Google form, um, just a few questions, and we would really uh, love to have some input so that we can use that to enhance um, you know our offerings. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, thanks very much. Um, oh, okay, so no more questions. <laughs> um, good. So, yeah, if there's no other question on the challenge topic. Uh, there is one question. No, oh, that's was, the same yeah. one. Sorry, that's the one yeah. from Dent. It's the right. farm to fork one. Apologies. Yes, yes. yes. So, uh, yeah, so if there's no more question on the challenge presentation, then yeah, maybe we can open up for just you know, our other question that we might have skipped through throughout the presentation, our webinar today. Uh, so uh, all the panelists, can we turn on our camera to show our face? <laughs> um, can you see, let's have a little bit more in-depth discussion. Um, first, maybe starting with uh, Pythagoras on the, the pricing and costing and uh, the strategy to make it Open, open and available to wider audience and also at the scalable infrastructure. I think you discussed a little bit uh, previously, but uh, can you uh, just kind of elaborate a little bit uh, what it means for users, users' uh, perspective, of what it means to use CG Labs and is there any application of using CG Labs? Uh, yeah, we need to understand that uh, uh, there are two uh, uh, points of, of course. One, uh, one uh, uh, point is uh, the development of uh, the, uh, is the integrated platform per se, and this is uh, uh, the offering from uh, Big Data Platform. And this is uh, an open source solution built totally over uh, open source modules. So any anyone, and I mean literally anyone, can uh, can just take it, extend it, set it back, uh, fork it. Uh, do whatever it wants, and this is the main offering from uh, the uh, from the uh, eyes of the big data platform. Obviously, we need to have a demo space for demonstrating what this is about, and this is the place where we will crash test uh, uh, with uh, this uh, hackathon. Uh, and the other uh, uh, cost uh, center actually are the computational resources. Uh, needed when you, you do experimentation. And uh, at that uh, part, sky is the limit. If you want to, to run something uh, uh, really, really intensive that will be executed in, in huge machines, uh, uh, many machines for many months, then it will result in, uh, in an extreme cost that actually this is a cost that you typically need uh, in, in the organization that you, you sit on. So this is not uh, to my understanding, this is not part of the big data platform. This is part of, of the needed experimentation that you have as a researcher, that you have as a group, that you have as an organization. So this is a cost center that uh, you cannot uh, uh, transfer to the to the side of, of the big data platform. Uh, from from our side, whatever we uh, we create uh, is as I said, open source and builds on components that are again open source to ensure that this is something that has been initiated here, uh, the, uh, but uh, we are thinking also uh, from the eyes of sustainability. Uh, this is why we build on, commu on community supported modules because this, these uh, modules will be uh, updated by the community, by the community of, uh, of Jupyter, by the community of the different domain toolings, by uh, everyone that is responsible for uh, that part, that piece. Either this is a tool, 
uh, or this is an infrastructure component or this is uh, data per se. Okay, thank you. So I, I hope that answers. So there is this infrastructure piece uh, that CG Lab is uh, you can take it and you can make your own CG Lab on your environment if you want. Uh, but just for using what we develop for Guardian ecosystem uh, within CGIR, this platform, uh, you're free to use, just connect to uh, Globus and come and create your workspace as I just briefly walked through to do climate mean, change adaptation, uh, adaptation analysis. Uh, yeah, you are free, uh, welcome to come and do it uh, if you want. Um, okay, so we oh, had a question, um, mm -hmm. Jawu from I think Ade, uh, Devi Viranata, and I think you can unmute yourself or I, I just I have to do this thing allowing people to talk, which I can't ah. stand. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I don't yeah. know how to wholesale allow everybody to talk. But, but I'll I'll just raise your hand and I'll I'll, I'll unmute. I'll you know okay. do that. So you should be able to talk. Ade, can you can you talk? Um, there is an unmute mic, uh, the mute button on the left side of the screen. Are there? So the bottom left, um, it'll say mute, unmute if you want to talk. Hmm. Or you can just type your question in the yeah, chat yeah, if fine. that's easier. Yeah. Okay. And methods or, or uh, while we are waiting, did you want to say more about this uh, farm to fork approach? Like how we are trying to address this whole... Sure, sure. So I'm not sure if it will address it or not, or to what extent it will address it. I think it'll go some of the way there. But, um, you know, there is the food ontology. And so that is something that um, that we can use to, to get at that farm to fork uh, uh, you know, the, the, to, to make sure that our data sets can be used um, regardless of what, where they, it's not pure, uh, you know, field research data sets in the, in the agronomic domain, for instance, or the breeding domain. It could be uh, data on, on consumption or uh, food quality, for instance, which, which I think maybe what you were talking about, Bent, I'm not sure. I don't even know if Bent is around, but um, if, if you are, uh, I don't know if I'm answering that question right, but but I think that's what you were getting at. So again, that would be Joe. The short answers through controlled vocabularies and ontologies, and that would be you know where they exist would be um, the 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 food ontology is the obvious one I think of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are there any other questions? Um, okay, so I don't see any other questions, and we are right on time. So <laughs> maybe, yeah, we can. Well, do do um, do do look at the survey that I pasted uh, in the chat. And if again, if you have questions, you want follow up, you want sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, please don't hesitate to to reach out to us. Um, I didn't. I don't know if everybody knows our emails, but you can find us pretty easily, and I will put them in the chat again. If if all of you are okay with that. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. Start with the ones I know by heart. <laughs> and you know, you can get to us. Um, and we'll connect you with with others if if needed. So let me just find Julian. Julian, do you want to put your email in the chat? It's easier. Yes. Okay. And Pythagoras, why don't you do the same for yourself? Yeah. Great. Okay. So excellent. So any final remark, Eta? I will let you finish. Not for me. Um, thank you very much for, you know, all of you for, for putting this together. And, and I hope that our, our participants found it useful and will jump in and try CG Labs because we would really, really appreciate the feedback um, and, and understanding, you know, sort of make it much more demand driven in that sense, right. is, you know, trying to understand what users want that's not already provided.
right. That's yeah. all I have to say, Joe. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. And and again, uh, uh, look out for the newsletter next week to learn more about the competition. Uh, feel free to break it. Uh, maybe you can find a way to break it and really uh, demand a lot of resources.